And welcome back from the break. This is the big issue and a special welcome to our viewers on television. Over the past one hour, we've been discussing the 2022 budget, uh, which is aimed at creating an, an entrepreneurial nation, of course, fiscal consolidation. At least that is what the finance minister indicated in the presentation in parliament. Uh, we've just, we're just about completing the discussion or finishing the discussion in relation to the new taxes, the topical E-level, 1.75% on all electronic transactions. If we went to the break, Mr. Alex Mold was yeah. making the point. So just I was just talking about to, the, the bank. To, 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 to wrap um, up on that. Yeah, the bank, bank transfer fees. Because mm -hmm. in the budget, and I don't know whether they're going to take the budget back. Because in the budget, it says bank transfers. It didn't say bank transfer fees. And if it's bank transfer fees, why are they bringing them back in? Because the NDC brought it in, and it was fought, and it was taken out. And now you're bringing it back in. Um, our vice president is the one who um, said Momo should not be taxed. So why are we now taxing Momo? And this is what I'm talking about, the flip-flop policies. Or maybe he wasn't involved in this. That's why I said the EMT maybe not have been involved in this budget at all. Because if he was, he would have, he would have opposed to it. <laughs> because you, you can't say something that it, and give a rationale for it. So what has happened since he said that in 2019 till today? What has happened? What has changed? Sometimes the, the, the circumstances determine. Yeah, so I, I want to know what they are because maybe you know. Because I, I definitely don't know what has changed, apart from the fact that a realization has happened that we don't have enough revenue, or we're not we're not we're not we're not have, we're not able to collect enough revenue. And the question: If you're not able to collect enough revenue, what is the main issue? Is the main issue that people are avoiding tax? or there's evasion of tax. If the people are avoiding tax, then bring in something like an alternative minimum tax and tax people uh, based on um, an adjusted uh, income or based on, 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 on your sales. Um, and if you want to rope in the informal uh, sector, enforce it, but reduce the taxes so that you entice people to pay. So reduction of taxes actually may be a good thing if you want to actually rope in a lot of people. Now you have the digitized uh, economy, so you can now enforce it. And, and, but to do that, reduce the taxes first and get people to pay and to get to understand the actual you know, uh, sector revenue. And then you can project. You can work with them and, to, and have consultations with the various sectors to see what works for them. Because everybody knows they have to pay tax. And some people will say, well, we, are, we, don't, we will only pay tax if you give us good service. So the government has to start giving good services. People have to start paying the taxes. Problem is, how do you encourage people to pay taxes? And uh, put in 1.75% 1 1 on uh, Momo transactions is a lazy way of doing this. Okay. Let's we'll continue with the discussion, but let's have an understanding of how the industry players, the telcos and operators, um, have been reacting to this uh, Announcement by government. The decision to slap a 1.75% tax on electronic transactions has been met with fierce opposition from a number of Ghanaians. For many, this is a deviation from government's plan of digitizing the economy and an action that will only worsen the plight of Ghanaians. A video of Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia speaking against taxing mobile money has been pointed to as a testament of this deviation. The point is that you are not taxing mobile money. And it is, for me, my view and that we should not tax mobile money. Because mobile money transactions, a lot of the people who are using these transactions are very poor people. You know, someone will get sent five CDs or mobile money. You, why would you want to tax that? But the government has since maintained that the move will increase revenue for several developmental projects. Key stakeholders who may play active roles in the implementation of this tax say the announcement came to them as a surprise. When we got this information, when that, uh, the minister went to parliament yesterday, it was surprising. There, there, was, there had not been any prior engagement. We were expecting that if for nothing at all, uh, government will have to consult us or do the needed extensive um, you know, engagements before finally thinking of 
including it in, in, in such uh, policy uh, for the year 2022. The underpinning rationale for initiating this tax is born out of the increasing number of electronic transactions carried out by Guineans. Finance Minister Ken Oferiata, while making the announcement, indicated that the value of transactions in 2020 was estimated to be over 500 billion Ghana cities. Mobile money users, however, have bemoaned the additional cost this will bring on electronic transactions. If they can do something about it, it will be very nice because it's too much. I'm not going to lie to you. Communications Minister Esla Ousu Ikufo has, however, assured that the government will soon engage telecommunication companies for a possible review of the service charges on mobile money transactions. The service providers are collecting 2%, one from the sender, mm -hmm. one from the receiver. Yeah. And I think that we need to look at that as well. I'm built to have a conversation with them tomorrow mm -hmm. on this matter. When approved, the tax is expected to be applied to bank transactions, mobile money payments, and inward remittances. Some believe this will erode the gains made in the financial inclusion agenda. Definitely the rational being would all now start uh, you know, paying cash. So the thing that we have been trying to correct, where you go to say that crab mall and you see people go to the ATM to cash money and then go and use that you know, to pay for services at either game or shop, right? You know, then that is going to continue. Another example is that less, you know, the work that has been done uh, with all stakeholders and we are pushing back on the uh, volume of scratch cards that are actually sold and we're pushing for a lot more where you can use your bank, you know, app to be able to purchase your airtime or you can use your mobile money uh, to purchase airtime. If we're not careful and we decide that if you went to buy your airtime using this electronic means, uh, you then have to pay an extra 1.75%, then we'll now be reversing all of that and going back to where people then have to take cash and go and buy a scratch card and scratch it before loaded. Mobile money agent Zoso fear their jobs and investments are at risk. The customer needs us. We also need the customer. And so if the customer is not feeling so much comfortable transacting business using the mobile money platform, then it means they may try to resort to other means of um, getting their businesses uh, transacted. And it will be at the expense of the mobile money uh, agent. Government officials, however, insist the policy has been thoroughly analyzed to exclude the poor would you prevent the scenarios painted by persons opposing the tax? You think that it is easier to go back to the cumbersome nature of transacting in cash, forgetting about the convenience, which we all have to pay for mm -hmm. to ensure that that service continues running. If you think it is easier to carry money in sacks yeah. and risk being attacked by robbers along the way and take transportation, to carry that money to wherever we need to take it to and factor in all that cost won't you at the end of the day come to the conclusion that it is cheaper to still use the digital platform despite these assurances some tax analysts have made references to sub-saharan countries like uganda and congo where mobile money you say has reduced after similar tax decisions were implemented to oppose the policy. We saw in Uganda a similar thing was introduced, um, 1% of mobile money transactions, and over 70% of subscribers stopped using Momo. And they have used it to 0.5%. And so people stayed away from, from that. So apart from the fact that it's, it's um, a threat to our digitization agenda, the next issue is that the rate is very high. 1.75% is very high. So telcos are taking 1% and then government is going to take 1.7%. That is almost like 3%. I mean, I would prefer to use cash. The policy has been regarded by many as a substitute for the scrapping of tolls on roads and bridges. Revenue generated from it is expected to be used to support youth employment, cybersecurity, and digital and road infrastructure. But how much is government expecting to make of this tax? If you're looking at the merchants, mm -hmm. 
debit payments, sending transfers, transfers to vouchers and the cash outs. We're looking at 440 million mm. from the merchants. If you're looking at gifts and merchant payments and direct debit payments and organizations paying to customers and paying bills and sending monies, we're looking at 45 million. So in total, it is possible for government to get about 500 million from this mm -hmm. in a month. Mm. Yes. So that's for mobile money? No, that's for mobile money and then um, yeah, that's for mobile that's money. For mob <laughs> <laughs> so that was a report put together by my colleague uh, Hansen Ajeman. Before we went on the break, you had some interventions to make in relation to the submission from uh, Mr. Alex Mode on the taxes I, I i think that uh, by and large it's it's the the, the fact that we have all agreed okay. and even when he was talking about our, 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 our activities on the euro market and all mm -hmm. of that uh current um, 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 assessment by features and p and Moody's and the likes you know our grading and all of that it, it, it brought down to our ability to sustain this levels and the obvious the obvious um, 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 issue with, with the economy is our ability to, to generate enough revenues. And, and if we are bringing in policies, all the government will access uh, some support from Ghanaians. Um, and the fact that um, we should know that um, for us to be able to progress and share the prosperity uh, uh, around for everybody to, to, to fill it is our ability to be able to generate this revenue and, 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 and share it amongst ourselves. I mean, it's, 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 it's the way to go. And I'm sure that we'll get the support of Ghanaians as, as this budget goes into its next phase before okay. for approval. All right, Franklin, if you're, if, if you're there, you know, on this issue of uh, E-Levy, e the concerns about the approach has, has been raised. Of course, the, the, the underpinning of raising revenue to, back, to spend and to bridge the deficit in terms of uh, the economic structure as it is now is one that has been agreed upon. But the approach that is that is the main concern that has uh, come up in this in this discussion you know some people have said that this approach is unimaginative um simply because the argument being made that well it's convenient to collect okay that's one of the arguments that is being made that is convenient to collect and somehow dovetails into my question I, I like to ask Professor uh, Texan. And, uh, and of course, I'm sure my good friends, uh, Alex and uh, uh, Inusa, could also answer. So, you see, I've always asked myself this question. When we complain about the fact that, well, the tax to GDP is so abysmal, the rate is so abysmal, the question I have is, what exactly should go into creating that growth before it will be taxed? And are we doing enough to create the growth before you tax that growth? I've always wondered about that question. And I ask, and, I, and then I, I probably to give another, uh, to extend it a bit. So I ask myself, what is the cost of doing business in this country? Have we been looking at those cost, of, those cost drivers because it looks to me that once the cost of doing business keeps going high, and it's been really going high, really, it's not static, then definitely to affect your productivity. And uh, when people are not productive, to <laughs> are not productive, it also affects the ability to pay. So you'll be going in circles and circles and circles, which is why I come back to the same point I, men I, I kept mentioning, uh, I've been mentioning on this program. What is this command control type of politics or interventions that our state continues to make without proper, uh, should I call it, proper responses or proper accountability? Look at how much money we are spending on so, the so-called IPEP. Mm -hmm. What are the cost of those con contra contracts? What happened to the value for money project that my good friend Baumia started? Can we say same for most of the government interventions project-wise, so that the cost of doing this project has an indirect bearing on the cost for everybody else in order to, as it were, 
uh, to keep the well, it has a cost, direct cost of everybody else. Because if those projects are not executed properly and they deteriorate or are not used, what it means is that the government comes back again and says, "Well, we still need money to do projects. We still need money to do Agenda 111." What is the cost of Agenda 111? When I say cost, I don't mean just the figures. I mean value for money, the cost of the contract. Should the government be doing them, or should they, should they partner the private sector to do 70% and the government does just about 20, 80% and the government does about 20%? These roads that are being going to be constructed, if they are supposed to be productively done and done well and do not break, uh, fall apart within the, the shakes of a lampstand, why not the private sector do it and get told, told the roads? Right? So I've always asked myself, when we make the rationalization that the, 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 the tax paying back bucket is, uh, sorry, the basket is so small, the question I have is, who is supposed to encourage that growth in the first place in order to tax it? Mm-hmm. I think I need answers. Okay, very well. So we'll move on to the issue. Um, and of course, if there are any comments, we may tie that in in the next in, in the next submission. But I need to move to the issue of, of road tolls, which is also another issue that, that, that came up. The, yes, the public tolls on public roads being scrapped. Now, it's something that has also generated or has incurred the wrath of, of Parliament, if I may put it that way. Now, uh, the Speaker in the week directed the Minister for Roads and Highways to withdraw his directive for the immediatization of the collection of tolls on public roads. The directive was issued by the Speaker after a press release from the ministry calling for the immediatization of collection of tolls, and which was raised as an agent mi- matter by the minority leader on the floor of Parliament. Following a debate on the subject, uh, Speaker Obambagwin said the instruction by the minister was illegal and should be withdrawn. He argued that although the cessation of tolls on public roads was announced in the 2022 budget, it remained a proposal until Parliament approves it. He said until then, the minister had no right or legal basis to issue directives for road tolls, which are a source of government revenue approved by Parliament to be seized. Alban Bagwin described as disrespectful the unilateral decision of the minister, saying that he may have made such a move due to his misunderstanding of the law, but is required to immediately reverse this directive. The Minister for Finance announced in the 2022 budget on Wednesday government's policy proposal for the scrapping of tolls on all public roads. Subsequent to that, the Ministry of Roads and Highways released a statement directing the immediate cessation of the collection of road tolls. On Wednesday, the Minority Leader Harun Idrisu drew the attention of the Speaker to the communication indicating that it was illegal. The Honourable Minister for Roads must be told that this action and conduct of his is in excess of his powers as minister and an attempt to dilute the mandate and authority of this august house mr speaker we are speaker the budget policy and economic statement as presented by the honorable minister of finance itself even the policy principles and policy have not been approved by this august house let alone the important aspects of the law and legislation of fees and charges which prescribes what must be paid. Mr. Speaker, we are a country governed by law. The minister can be in a hurry to listen to the dictates of the president as he admonished him to be in a hurry. But he cannot be in a hurry with the law. The majority leader of CHM Bonsu provided justification for the press release from the Minister for Roads and Highways. The minister acted timelessly to save life and property. <laughs> the speaker, that is why that is why the directive was not about the suspension of the law. The minister could not have suspended the law. He only dealt with the operationalization of the law in place. After a number of submissions from some members of the House, the Speaker issued a directive for a withdrawal of the directive from the Minister for Roads and Highways. Those are policy proposals that the Minister has presented to the House. Until they are approved, 
nobody, and I mean nobody, has the authority to start implementing something that doesn't exist. But does that amount to a disrespect of the house? And so it's for us to draw his attention and tell him that you have no such authority. I call him to honorably withdraw that directive. Failure to do so will be a serious breach. A serious breach of the directive of the speaker. And that will amount to contempt of parliament. After the directive, the majority chief whip Frank Anodompre expressed the majority's disagreement in clear terms with the directive of the speaker during a press briefing. I think the speaker, for want of a better word, the speaker erred in his ruling. And maybe he should consider it again. We are also aware of the options available to us. If we want to challenge the speaker, we come by a motion. We know all that. But we want to put on record that the speaker erred. The Ministers for Food and Agriculture and Defence answered questions in relation to the unavailability of fertilizers in the country and the state of construction of the Afari Military Hospital. So that's the reaction from Parliament in relation to um, what many may call a policy disconnect or otherwise as to the announcement and the implementation already being carried out. Now what is saying is, is, is here. Many say that the minister indicated on the floor of parliament that this takes effect after the budget is passed. And then the next moment there's a press release from the Ministry of Roads and Highways that it takes immediate immediate effect. And all, even, even the concern about the, it's, the, the SPD implementation and even its effect on, 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 on those around. Would it, would it be wrong if it's described as a faux pas on, on the part of the implementers of this? <coughs> Um, Duke, it, it was a, it, it was a situation that um, perhaps a lot of us um, did not anticipate at the time of reading of the budget. But as to whether or not the minister uh, is also something that is also evolving, um, we, we should understand that the, the, the budget process actually ends with the passing of the Appropriations Act. And so that becomes law. It is then at this stage that the policies that Parliament has actually accepted and agreed upon becomes what actually transpired and automatically gets into um, 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 an implementation on the, on the first year of the ensuing year. Typically, we will expect that, um, even per what the Minister said whilst reading the budget, that um, we have waited for the approval of the budget by, by, by Parliament before some of these policies actually started running. But you see, um, Parliament as a, yeah. as a legislat le legislative arm of, of, of government um, passes laws. But the actual implementation of these laws is done by the executive. The implementation, the day-to-day -day operationalization of those laws actually takes place and it's, it's done by the executive. And so the ultimate outcome of this is reported back to parliament. They, you, can, you can mention that um, whatever tools were supposed to have gotten from the time the budget was read to end of year is already been appropriated for in the 2021 budget. Yes, that's, that, that's true. But the reality is that the actual situation on the grounds also feeds into the outcome of that appropriation that was done for the 2021 um, um, year. From what, from what we gather and from what the majority leader said, I mean, for some of us, we still have to be listening and, and get, gathering um, information from them. If after the announcement of that, of the, of that policy, the announcement of that policy, there were situations that, that required that the Minister of Roads acted to save life and property. Then it was, it was proper that he did that. And he was going to report back to Parliament. It did not amount technically to him varying the law that Parliament has made. Or the Act, the, 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 the Road Tools Act. It, it, it does not amount to it. His was the operationalization to ensure that this, this law is actually operated in a conducive environment to 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 uh, to save life and property so if that was the aim of the of the minister and as as has been explained i don't think it was it was out of line 
subsequently, I mean, we all know it's the budget process is, is begun. And I, I don't think that um, it is one of the policies that will face any in in the blocks in, in Parliament. There, there's Look, a concern. There's a concern okay. that, for instance, the, this is, I mean, the announcement was for it to take effect after the appropriation has mm. been passed. So mm. if you take a retrospective mm. look, you would notice that the monies that have been projected to be spent till the mm. end of the year mm. has to be collected. So if you if you indicate that they should cease forthwith, what about the amount that would have been lost between now and this, uh, I, I alluded December to that. 31st? I alluded to that. If in the process of ensuring that the appropriation that was made for 2021, that, um, I mean, we're going to take votes up to uh, 31st December, 2021. I mean, we had accounted and, and, and budgeted for all the amounts, yes. But if the minister who operationalizes the laws finds out that we are unable to do this within uh, an atmosphere that will protect life and property, and do he needed to immediately take steps to ensure the safety of Ghanaians, I, I think that he wasn't out of line. To the extent that to the extent that he was protecting life and property, that was that was that was it. And he was not varying the law that Parliament is passed. It's not the first time. There are many acts that Parliament is passed, which is which are not being operationalized by by the executive. There are many of them. I would I won't want to go go down to enumerate them. There are many of them. What is Parliament doing about it? That we have passed legislation that is not being operationalized by it. But to the minister. Is in charge for day-to-day -day administering of this process, and that is that is and, and that that is his um, assessment of the situation. That we have to save life and property. We have to do this to ensure that Ghanaians actually live in, in in harmony. We don't we don't get up one morning to to realize that people are already losing their teeth, and and given the 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 the, the, the nature of the people on at the toll booths, a lot of them are people um, living with a disability and all of that. You don't want people going attacking them because they've heard that they're not supposed to be paying tolls. And you, you know this thing about taxes. People don't want to pay taxes. Either. So when they know that they have some relief and you still insist on them paying, there's bound to be some disconnect there. And, and I, I, I think that um, the intent of the minister was not to to, 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 to vary the law as passed by parliament, but to operationalize and ensure that um, we are doing this within um, some level of um, security and all of that. If, if that is that is what it was intended, I didn't I didn't think it's out of place. I think that this minister is a very senior member of parliament himself, a lawyer, and so he should app he appreciates some of these things. And I, I I think that it's 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 not something that should get us to work up. The, the, the speaker is giving a directive, but I've also seen a subsequent uh, press release from the ministry. I hope that we are able to conclude on this thing and move on. There are bigger things that we need to address. Like like the instant um, 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 rolling out of this policy, the people who actually uh, make their daily bread from the tools. I mean, yes, it could have been too sudden, it could have been, but I am sure that it is not too late. We can actually go back there says the I need see what we can immediately do to be able to assuage them at least from now to Christmas and for, 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 for them to also get there or be able to sustain their source of livelihood. Mm -hmm. Already in the policy we, we addressed the the, 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 the the situation of the people who work and within the toll booth. I mean the attendance at the toll booths their, their their situation has been addressed. Um I, I was privy to some discussion that is going to see those who could be assimilated into the mainstream of the ministry, those who want to be retrained and given capital to go back to do other things. So it's it's a it's a it's a fluid are, are, are there situation. Are there so that because the I mean months back there mm -hmm. was one that leads to to, to commerce. I think that Kubasi, which was removed because it was causing causing traffic from our, yes, but from from our monitoring, looks like as those who were in that. Who am, who am in that booth managing it, uh, the attendance then, mm. as of now, they have still not been reintegrated into I, I, I am sure other, that I am sure uh, that despite the assurances that were given to them. I recollect that and I, 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 I remember following the discussion on your platform mm -hmm. 
on, on the removal of that particular booth. Mm -hmm. At the time the booth was removed, I didn't see the Speaker of Parliament complaining that um, the, the, the minister was, was acting in ultra bias to the, to the act. Mm -hmm. It was an operational decision that had to be taken by the minister because he had gone through traffic himself. And he, as I said today, he had realized that, look, Ghanaians are, are probably wasting too much on fuel, emissions, time, and, and productive hours at the tools that could, could, could actually benefit or be more productive elsewhere. I, I, I hear that there is some um, study that COPEC or something, some institution has done. I mean, this tool boot is costing the economy in the range of excess of 400 million per annum. Given that we only rake in a, a, a little over 17 million, it makes sense that we, we, we get rid of it. So we're able to save in excess of our 330 million in, in, in a year. It, it makes sense. The minister's intent, like he's explained in his, his subsequent um, press and um, release, was not to vary the laws that parliament made, but to operationalize what, 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 what we already have. So those, those, those of us who are already um, stretching this into the PFMA Act and all of that, yes, it, it's all good. It's all good and well, but the operationalization of every act lies with the executive, and that is exactly what the minister intended to do. Okay, well, let's look at the the economic cost to this uh, decision. That's the, the economy around these tow boats, tow boats, and on the flip side, the boost to productivity for road users. Okay, I think that this road tow had to be removed. I mean, it had to be abolished. Uh, so I share in the sentiments of this government. Because um, if you've been in traffic at one of those roads, you would understand. For those who daily ply those roads to their place of work, it's a huge nuisance to them. Um, it's, technology has not been used properly in collection of food tolls. Elsewhere, you don't need to pay to any attendant. Um, your, your normal place should be, you should be able to buy the, the, the uh, what do you call it? The pass. The pass. And then you get there and it opens for you, you are gone. I mean, so uh, we didn't do well in putting in place the infrastructure for us to allow us to collect the rotors. So definitely it was having a counterproductive impact on productivity in this economy. Um, but then I think the whole confusion about who has the legitimate right to ask to stop or not stems from the budget itself. Uh, I've always awesome. known budgets are read for a period, and uh, I was expecting that this budget I was read for 2022 was going to take effect from 1st January. I didn't know why the Minister of Finance said that it will be immediate after it's approved. When Parliament approves the budget, it's supposed to take immediate effect or for the period of time which the budget is supposed to reflect. And you asked Honorable a very good question. Does it have implications for the revenue that we projected to collect this year? When you come in and then you stop the collection of that. I can understand that the idea was to get um, those who are suffering from that to ease them of the stress and all of that. But for me, I thought that if we are taking time to clearly indicate the budget that this was going to take effect from January 1st, 2022, the sort of commotion that arose for the midst of highways, uh, roads, to come up with this directive wouldn't have risen at all. because. I think that the idea that when Parliament approves its immediate effect, a lot of people do not know the parliamentary process. At times, people think that as soon as the minister reads the budget, the Parliament has approved it. So I'm sure those were the people who got there and said, no, we are not supposed to pay. So if we had given timelines, like we are going to do for this e-levy and all of that, Ghanaians would have prepared themselves towards that. And most importantly, for those who earn a living around the economy that is created around these turbulence, they are doing legitimate business. Mm. Now for them, Hawking, mm. the Hawking uh, mainly Hawking. describe Hawking as, at least in, in that instance, as one that is not no sanctioned. But, I mean, but, but in this part of the world, you cannot say that Hawking is, is, is not an economic activity. The safety of the people there. Yes, we can, we can look at that. There are a lot of activities that we do in this economy that put people at risk. Mm -hmm. But they want to earn a living. Yeah. Do we want them to go and do other things that are counterproductive to, I mean, like prostitution and arm robbery and that? Is that what we want? No. I mean, if they earn a decent living there and they comport themselves, well, I don't find any problem with that. For me, what is my concern is that the dieting was so sudden. Okay. You can imagine a woman who in the morning had frozen her, uh, or, or put in, uh, in the coolers, uh, chillers, all the, the, the drinks and water, 
and was getting to there, and then she gets there, and then, no, <laughs> you can't do this. At times, when you want to pursue policies that have very good initiative and well thought out, we need economic agents to make adjustments okay. so that the impact of that policy in terms of the cost is not severe mm -hmm. on those who it will hit. I mean, we sit here and we are laughing over this, but people have lost their livelihoods. There are kids who have to go to school. Well, some of them, what they make daily is what they use to feed their families. What they make daily, the profit, is what they use to give to their kids to go to school. And all of a sudden, this is gone. So I think that that was where the issue came from. Now, as to how we can get them something as an alternative, is an issue that you even raised about the, 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 the one that was closed on the Kumasi Road yeah, and yeah. issues about resettling them into another alternative job. Um, I've heard the um, people with disability complain that they were not consulted. This is all of a sudden hit them. I think that um, it's not too late. Um, I know this policy is well intentioned. I mean, I'm for it. It's, it's an excellent, it's one of the excellent things that we did in the budget. Okay. It's only that the alternative for the revenue loss, where we are taking from the ELA we don't have a problem with. And I think that we could have put it on motor uh, tax okay. at the DVLA when you go in new alliances and we would have gotten much more, okay. 10 times more than what we are collecting. So that's the problem I have. But the intent is, is okay. We need, as a matter of agency, to engage those who have lost their life loose around the city. And it's not only those who are hawking. Those who sit in the booth itself, they've also lost their livelihood. They are engaging what you term a, 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 a legal economic activity. Well, when I was addressing the budget. It was addressing no, the budget, but it, if they were not engaged before the policy itself, like we are now going to do the engagement. <laughs> For how long is this engagement going to take place? Now, if we say, and I've heard of Deputy Minister of Finance say that, look, we are going to keep them on their payroll. They are not going to lose anything. It's just that they are not going to sit there. Does it have problems, issues for our expenditure? These are the sort of things that we do that we necessarily overexpend and we need to collect revenue for. We need to plan things properly. And when we do these things, the impact on the economy in terms of our finances and our revenue will make a headway with this. But in terms of the, the, the practical steps for those who are in the... If I want to review the uh, word, the use of illegality in terms of what maybe in the in the informal sector or informally, for if that, that if that washes, what are the practical steps that can be taken to ensure that the effects of this policy is not that dire on, 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 on them? Because since readily for for those who are within the system of the ministry, yeah. they can easily find something for them to yeah. do. But what about uh, the, the the others? I'm not too sure um, immediately what can be done because, of course, the, 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 the booths have been closed, cars are driving past uh, at the speed that they are driving. <laughs> Even if they have something to sell, nobody will stop to. Um, for them, they shouldn't worry because one thing I know about traffic is that the traffic will go and mess somewhere else. <laughs> so they shouldn't worry. They should just hold on for a few days. The travel will go and make some well so they can go there and go and do their business. That's just on the lighter side. But I think that we need to engage them. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, but they are doing legal activities. What is legal activities? If it's legal, why did we allow them in the first place? Does it mean that we condone legality? They are earning a livelihood by selling. If there are jobs for them, they will not be doing what they are doing. So if they are trying to make an attempt to earn a living, we shouldn't come up with that communication that what you are doing is illegal. We don't need to engage you. We need to engage them. We need to let them understand that if there are any schools that they need, we have so many youth employment interventions all, all over. Is it possible to get them to go and retrain and do other things and not sell on the streets? That is even a bigger debate that we need to be having. Not because it's not only at the tobos. At the traffic lights, they are there. Right? I'm sure those who are at the entry of the town motorway from Accra will move right now to Siesta Royal and other traffic lights around to do their business, and they will still be in business. So if we need to take them off the streets, we need, and I remember when President Kufo took up, uh, office, 
one of his first promises was that he was going to get them off the streets. And that was what started these youth employment programs that we started from, the government interventions. Because they, they thought that President Kufo meant white-collar jobs. So right after he took office, they went to the ministry to go and look for the work that was being promised. Before we started the schools, training, all of that. We can uh, let them avail themselves to some of these opportunities so that if it's bakery or something, agro-processing, we can get them to do that in a more meaningful way and get back their livelihoods. So that is something that we should take a look at. But for me, I'm more concerned about why in a budget that was supposed to be for 2022, directives come that immediately something should stop. If we wanted it to stop, we could have used other channels to say, you know, 2020, I mean, we are in 2021, go to parliament and say, look, this is a nuisance. So we want to stop. We don't have to say that in the budget. And that is what has led to a confusion. So as a way forward, we need to be very careful when we are making some of these pronouncements. Because look, whether you like it or not, when budgets are read, economic agents are listening. They want to respond. Those that any initiative will benefit, will want to take the benefit immediately. Mm -hmm. Those who it will come at a cost will complain. So knowing that um, people were inconvenienced by the long traffic, at times hours, two hours. I mean, when you try traveling from Accra to, to the central region and you get to Kaswa, you can spend two hours just at the, at the toll booth. So immediately they hear this announcement, they're like, oh no, we can drive through. So when they get there, it's going to lead to a question. And if we even had predicted that, we could have allowed some security men to go there to contain the situation. So I'm not here to discuss whether the Minister of Roads has the legal, he has the power to do that or is a dietary for Parliament. For me as an economist, what I'm looking at is the disruption that's taking place in economic activities for those who end up living there. Either those legally working there in terms of the issue of the tickets or those who have formed an economy around that place. So uh, we need to take a look at it. There are also Ghanaians. Yeah. Um, if they have something doing, they will not be there. Mm -hmm. And really, wh whether we think it is legitimate or not, um, nobody has gone there to arrest them for <laughs> doing something illegal. Uh, if, you, if you get to the Kaswa one, there's a police station right there, right there. in front of them. So uh, I'm not sure it's illegal, even though we'll say that that is not a good job for them to do because it's risky, but they are any living. So that, that for me is the, is, is the point. And then also the fact that the, the issue of the lost revenue, of the 70 million, yeah. fine. Could we have collected revenue rather than use the e-levy? Yes, we could. So as Parliament debates it, let's ask the Minister of Finance, don't you think that we can take that 2.5 of the 1.75 off and rather impose it on you? Because look, mm -hmm. if you say that people should pay for road usage, who are those? If I sit in a rural part of Ghana somewhere, there are no more travel roads in my area. So if I'm doing good business, why do I have to pay for roads that I don't use? Yeah. I don't use the roads. Right? Those who own cars, cars should pay for the infrastructure of the road, road because they are the road users. They use the roads. So it is important that we take a second look at this and say, look, if you own a car, you are going to drive on our roads. I'm sure those who drive from Tema to Accra every day or from Kaswa to Accra every day, if you tell them that, look, we are going to open the road for you. Every year you are paying 400 cities, part of the roadworthy, and you don't have to drive through traffic. They'll be willing to do that. As I said, if you ask me to pay 400 cities as part of my DVLA, uh, my, my road worthy every year, so that I can drive anywhere in Ghana without having to be driving in traffic because I have to pay 50p. I mean, even the one at uh, Aibensan, go and ask those who go to the Eastern Region, they'll tell you when you get a Saturday morning at 8, you can be there until 11 a.m. before you leave. And you begin to ascend the, uh, what do you call it, the Pediasi, uh, 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 whatever it is. So, I mean, these are the sort of things that we need to be talking about with regards to the road tool. So, um, these, these are my comments on that. Okay, so in essence, the policy configuration is okay, but the implementation, so once think. again, that's, so that's, yeah, that's well. a point. We'll, we'll take a break here. When I come back, we'll wrap up. We'll take some comments and then concluding thoughts from our guests on this particular issue of the road tools and the matters arising. We'll be back after the break. Stay with us. <music> Okay.
Oh, welcome back. We apologize for that technical hitch. Just another message uh, to set the discussion in tune. Says this one from Alexander in North Ligon says, uh, the traffic on on the spin text route is too much, but there is no toll booth. I sometimes use the motorway, pay tolls, and use the exit at Abatua, which, is, which to me is faster. Just that it takes me further off my workplace. I think the toll booth shouldn't have been closed, but the issue looked at. Well, that's uh, your view of, uh, uh, on, this, on this issue. Let me uh, Mr. Alex Mood, on this yeah. matter of whether it's a policy disconnect, whether the issues were looked at in perspective before it being being, being implemented. Well, I think there are three things you talked about. One was, you know, uh, whether the minister erred or not um, by um, asking the toll boards to be um, closed down. Okay. And uh, it's very obvious from what the speaker is saying that, yes, he erred. And I think it, there was also an error made in the budget where it said it was immediately after approval. As we know, budgets are uh, made for the beginning of the year, so it should have been very clear in the budget that it should have been at the beginning of the year and not uh, so that there was no ambiguity. But yes, the, the minister stepped um, over his, his, bound, his boundaries to, to step in, and there's a lot of spinning going on about people fighting at the boots, which is understandable. Um, uh, and there's also the issue about the... Uh, the economy around the toll boots and what could have been done. Um, and it's quite simple. If you really thought through it, you could have decided that you still want this uh, drive-through supermarkets, as we call them. You know, you could you could you could have a place where people uh, stop, your cars can go there and buy things and continue on the road. So you could create that. And these are the kind of things that the economic management team should think about when a policy is 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 is, is, is thought of as to what are the implications to the various stakeholders. But for me, one thing that I think also the economic management team needs to, to look at and advise the policy makers and the people who are going to execute it is that stopping tools is sending an immediate signal to the investment community that the government is not interested in the PPP efforts of doing um, roads, um, tolled roads, and as such, I don't know whether this is going to be a temporary measure or is a permanent measure, whether they're going to, after two years or three years, change the policy again and say we're going back to toll roads. Um, it should be very clear so that you send a clear signal to in the investment community what you are thinking of and what you're not thinking of. It you're looks like it's going to be a permanent ways. measure you're, because you're the ministry is communicating ways. that the boots will be removed in after this whole policy proposal has been finalized by the yeah, that, of the So budget. that means that there will be no more to be toll, toll roads. Looking at the productivity and economic no, So there will be no more toll roads. So what that means is that you're not going to invest um, in, 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 in major roads um, or that, that investment is going to come from the 0.25%, which is about 1 billion cities a year, or it's going to come from the 15% increase in the, um, the levies DVLE charge. And by the way, um, Prof said that, you know, we taking the toll booths out, you know, it's about 70, 80 million Ghana cities a, a year. And that should have been thought of in putting DVLA. They've increased DVLA as well. So next year, when you go, you'll be paying 15% increase in DVLA. What for? I don't know, but maybe it's for it's to replace the toll booths. Then you also have 0.25%, which is about 1 billion Ghana cities. Um, coming from the e-levy, which is going to roads as well. So it has to be very clear what the policy is and what you want to do. And you have to send a very clear signal to the investment community that this is what government intends doing long haul. Pe investors don't like policies that are chopped short. You're not going to get the financing to do that because they don't trust you. Um, you can change uh, your mind halfway. Um, they, they, so the investment community is, is not going to invest. The banks are not going to put money into it. So government needs to be very clear what the policy is going forward on road tolls and on, on how we're going to do the dualization of Kumasi roads, Cape Coast roads. Where is that money going to come from? Since we obviously cannot borrow directly. However, if you look at the levies that they have put together, um, the NHIS levy, the, all these levies, it comes to something close to 2.6 billion dollars or so, and I believe that they are intending. Their intention is to securitize that and raise money for investments, um, so that they do not rely on tax 
direct taxation um, to, to, to get new loans and to in, uh, get new debt. But one thing we have to look at as well, which we've, we've forgotten in the debt profile, mm -hmm. is that there are a lot of arrears. Mm -hmm. And I've looked in the budget and there's nowhere they've actually stated how much the arrears are. Our estimate is that it should be no, it's nowhere uh, lower than 30 billion um, Ghana cities. And these are arrears that are owed to contractors, are, are owed to the energy sector, and it, is, it's, it's, it keeps piling up. So the government has to come also with a clear you know, um, policy of how they're going to clear that debt. I just seen that they've only put about um, two or three billion as uh, arrears that they're going to pay in 2022, whereas our, the actual arrears are about 30 billion. Now, there's also another arrears that we have not added into our debt stock, which is the amount of debt government owes the SOEs. These are the VRAs, the Gridcos, the Ghana Gas, the GMPCs. All of these companies are owed by government directly or indirectly, and that comes to almost about 10 billion as well. So our debt, any analyst worth his salt is going to add all this debt to your current debt position to say this is the actual debt position of the government because of the country because the government has to make these payments in the future. So it's something that really we should be asking government to show us the balance sheets. And we also should be very critical of all the balance sheets of this state-owned enterprises to see how much debt is government parking in these SOEs. Okay, very well. Uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, have a quick intervention. Yeah, um, I just want to put some clarity on this um, road to um, policy. The, the, the policy actually read out that uh, this is on public roads. Public roads. When you engage in PPP, where it's a sharing of um, risk and return with the, with the private sector, I, I, I will find it difficult in being termed purely public. Okay. So over time, I don't think that it's sending any mixed um, um, direction to the investor community. It is very clear. It is on public road. So the University of Ghana, for instance, um, it has, a, it has a very nice asphalted roads within the university that a lot of uh, motorists want to use to swerve traffic from the Bungalow Shiashi to probably the Zungo Junction stretch of, the, of, of that road. But um, there's restricted access to it. You are, else you have to pay to be able to use the investor. So the, those are things that are, there, 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 there's clarity to it. So I don't think that it's sending any, any misreaction. I think it's very clear on public roads and that's, that's the intention. Okay. We have um, still on Zoom Franklin Kujo, uh, who would, uh, the same issue. And Franklin is very heavy on policy and criticizing government on, on, on policies. Let, in terms of let's oh. yes. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. yes so that's not means um i mean this this thing was deliberate um it was not an afterthought at all it was done to coincide with the e-levy uh to somehow in the somehow the uproar how, um, how do you explain nobody, that how do you explain not, that uh, listen no, we don't I'm, do that in a don't say you <laughs> just be quite categorically frank, like my name. The fact of the matter is that I, think, I mean, I think someone was just in a hurry to break to break a law, um, and and again, it was a convenient way of trying to somehow douse the flame of this e levy thing. Look, you cannot tell us that if you told us that this 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 this, this, uh, this will come into effect in January 2022 would be confused and they will start breaking toe boots and all, doing all kinds of things. I mean, this is an insult really mm -hmm. to most of us who, who use roads and to suggest that those who use roads are so, will be so angry that once a directive has been announced, it has to take immediate effect. At least we, we can read and write. And for those who think those who cannot read and write, but uh, ply passenger, I mean, uh, what's it called? Uh, commercial uh, cars and all of that. Uh, I don't think this, I mean, let's not mince words. This this is just what it was. I mean, clearly speaking. It's one of those uh, polit political, should I call it, uh, you know, games. Mm -hmm. So there, nothing can be further from the truth. 
there's no policy, there's no policy analysis about this to be made that to say that look this was too brazen and it's an insult to be told again that people were going to disorganize and break into all kinds of uh untoward behavior i don't i don't believe it and i and you see it's still it has still not been reversed has it okay so uh, we have um, Alex and Ampa being as well. Um, he's a fiscal policy specialist with Oxfam. He's not on yet. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, Frankly, yeah. I, it's, I it's, 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 it's interesting. To have the power Very to interesting. <laughs> Frankly, no, you, I'm you seeing are, a last word of you are, today. <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, occasionally, occasionally we do this. We say this. I mean, we say what, what exactly. Frankly, <laughs> it's just, policy it's just what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. The minister has to act in time, time timeously to be able to protect life. Next time we should time stamp. So his story. intent was not to vary the law, but to make sure to that time stamp the other law of uh, chaotic <laughs> situations and <laughs> improvements. <laughs> All right, but but how you recollect that as part of the, that press release, um, there was a directive given to security people to take charge of of, of the toll booths and direct traffic. So, um, in, stand, in, in spite of the plazas and the motorway, and as motorists could be directed to drive on directly without going by uh, all the all the infrastructure that has been put in place. So it was it was it was it was a tenuous intervention by by the minister to forestall. In a chaotic situation, again, what, what we used to know. Let, let me imagine. <laughs> let me imagine. The director did say that, oh, there's been some um, credible, uh, should yeah. I call it, stories that some places where people were vandalized. But when the newsmen went there, and I was watching TV, <laughs> they went to most of these places that they said that there, were vandal there was vandalization of property. Apparently, all these toll booths were intact, including very shaky toll booths. They were very. <laughs> what, what, what a situation was there were authentications between motorists and the people in the booth. We didn't say that uh, there were any. Um, 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 but to forestall all of that, the minister had this, to take a timely this, decision. And this that's exactly what this, this what, what, what has really is. brought the spin doctors out in there. Really. I mean, they, I they, this is not spin. They, they, they are having a, 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 tough job, a tough job with this budget. But, Maybe but, they should but, have done a dress rehearsal. <laughs> uh, frankly, let's let's look at the the, the, econo the economic cost of this of this road to issue, the cost involved. Uh, taking, I mean, oh, in, in terms of the 80, figures, 80 million. yes, eighty million. Like, there, there are about against one billion. As against even the the businesses that goes around or that that is located around these um, um, centers. Or what what would be your thoughts on that? And the drive, the, the drive through well, uh, You know, fact, fact of the matter really is that the, I think we should have uh, uh, digitized the this tool, should I call it the boots. Yeah. Uh, we should have done this much longer. But there's a conversation also to be had that some of these tools are not finding, are finding ways into private pockets and all of that. Okay. Maybe the, the amount we are charging is also quite low. Um, I thought we could have increased it a bit, probably to maybe increase it by about fifty percent, and then to, and then digitize the the toll booths. Okay. Then we will be able to make some headway. Um, the conversation about the the, the the what's it called the hawkers and the uh, uh, the, uh, the attendance businesses that yeah. are created around this. I mean, I that is a, it's a, it's an issue to also be co considered because you see you cannot say that they were illegally trading the fact of the matter is that because of the way the toll booth is structured it's it's, it's mechanical so somehow traffic um should i say collects at the at the toll booth and that creates an opportunity for people to also come and trade um, if you make, if you had made it, if you had digitized it, I'm not too sure this would have happened. So maybe instead of scrapping the two, the two acts, I rather digitized it. And don't we have some of the? I think that the motorway, there's the one or two of the two side trucks, right? Yes, yes, yeah. I think so. Apart yeah, from it, even if you go to, well, the airport one may not qualify because you pay towards. Uh, 
the, the the funds go to that of the Ghana Airport Company. So you still that that will qualify as a private tool and not a public tool. But I think that's also digital. Yes, for the parking, not just yes, for, for the, the parking. Yeah. Yeah. And then with anywhere yeah. where you have a private road, mm -hmm. government is obliged to give to make sure that the public have an alternative route where they are not charged. Yeah. And I don't see how that will work if government is not involved in the PPP by in doing a road from Accra to Kumasi. If it's a private person doing it solely, government will have to have an alternative route for we, the public, who don't want to pay the toll. Yeah. But so if government is the one doing it with, with the PPP, then you can have a toll. That is why I said it's important that government's policy is very clear. As for the yeah. Legon Road, there's another issue that if we, the taxpayer or taxpayers, are paying for the asphalting of the road in Legon, and they are charging a toll, and that is going into their Legon Consolidated Fund. That is another question that we shall ask. Maybe we need to Unless they are going to, pay, to, to use that money to pay for the maintenance <laughs> of the road and the toll, and no taxpayer is going to be, money is going to be used for the Legon roads. So we shouldn't let the taxpayer make private individuals and private institutions benefit. It's a wrong Le use of Le taxpayers' Legon, money. Legon, Legon is a public institution. Legon is a public institution, and I, I think that over the years we have had um, a lot of road networks that have been built up, um, opening up the university to all its, its uh, boundaries so that um, uh, we could have access to the university. I, I should think that Whatever we collect is used to maintain the road. So, <laughs> I, know, I, know. Um, I was talking about the private issues. I, I, I remember a lot of issues with the private issues. issues with, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the right. 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 Quite unfortunate, but uh, we've made a we've made a headway. Headway on that. Yeah, we've yeah. made a headway. But it's, it's very important that we understand yeah. that. Government needs to send a, a, the right yes. signal to the to the investors. Yeah, and we the understand private. that. Otherwise, yeah. you know. So I I don't think that scrapping the toll boots was it's a good idea. First of all, there's an economy around it. Nobody's talked and, about it. And and lastly, let me let me add. Uh, well, frankly, if, if is that frankly? Yeah. Let Frank me add to my. Yeah, let me add to my unconspiratorial theories as well. If the minister for roads <laughs> was uh, not so deliberate, why is it that the finance ministry has not asked that, uh, the communication ministry has not asked that the e levy should take effect immediately? <laughs> because. Because she knows a lot. Because those those who use <laughs> e levy, they are more liquid, right? That is not necessarily the case. You understand that the tax will take effect in January. <laughs> not necessarily the case. We all know anyway, that yeah. this budgetary uh, budget processes will have to continue this one, this one, yeah. until until the <laughs> passing of the appropriation <laughs> act, right? But in this case, there were there were there were there were reasons okay. why the minister had to intervene and do that. Time yourself, it was very important. It was very, very important why he had to do that. And I, I think that um, I, I, I would agree with him that um, it's important that for the, the, the ministry that was in charge of operationalizing that, that, that law, it was important that um, life and property was, was, was safeguarded. And, and, and it's not out of place. It wasn't, it wasn't um, and some sort of infraction upon the 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 the, 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 the expectations of parliament and all of that. I, I think that we can we can move on as a nation and then okay. get get this thing resolved. Final comments from across around the table on this issue if there are uh, yeah, I, I I think that um, we should move the debate away from the legality of the directive okay. to look at more of what we could have done better. And also, like I've said, to take a look at those that are going to be affected by the directive. Um, I should think that um, a road like the Chamamoto Way, mm -hmm. if it's possible, we can bring it back. I don't think that there's too much distractions in traffic on the Chamamoto Way. There are a lot of gates. And I'm aware that there, is, there are at least two of them that accept the electronic pass. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we could digitize all the others, I think that that could work. Um, so that even the money that is just collected there could be used only for the Tema Motorway. Um, I, 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 I'm very sad when I drive on the Tema Motorway um, because looking back over 60 years when Nkuma did that road, there has been no major addition to that road in terms of refurbishment. 
So we need, if we want to build an eight-lane road, because now it's no longer a motorway, <laughs> because people cross the road at mm. several uh, intersections, so it's no longer a motorway. Uh, we need to make it about eight-lane road from uh, Tema to Accra, Accra to Tema. And if we are saying that we don't have money, don't need to go and borrow. If we can raise tolls on the Tema motorway, I think that we should take a second look at it. Okay, all right. We now have our fiscal policy expert, um, specialist uh, Dr. Alex Ampabin, on joining us, join us, joining us on Zoom. So he would, um, Dr. Ampabin, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So let's let's begin. Take it from the top on the e levies, or the e levy that has been been um, announced and would be implemented if the budget is passed, and as well as the issues associated with the road tolls. So the tax components. Right. Thank you very much. Um, with the e-levies, e uh, but um, I think we need to clarify certain things. Majority of the transfers, as I think for myself, as I haven't done it for the but I know mostly are on this uh, I work at the spread of the money transportation, moving money from one person to another. So it will be supporting family members, it will be supporting the family business. So if I'm transferring money, which I have already seen, and those money have been back tax, and if I'm spent to the person, also buy something online. Or also, very great times. The question I'm asking is what economic activity has been So, go to the point where I believe government must need to go back to the way this is the reason I say that they have a tendency to wear the national Good government has been excellent and better has to do. The government has very good the last few years because of the success. But I'm afraid this kind of policy that uh, you go to the market these days, most people are accepting the value, which is good because that's the way to formalize the economy. But if more people are getting used to the mobile money, then just when we are getting stronger, we introduce set of contact with that same time. Then the chances are that uh, people will now say, I don't just set mobile money again. Or me being the buyer, I'll take it to the market because I'm not prepared to pay one point seven five pounds off of oh, okay. uh, the, the value of the item. I don't know which I don't want to I don't want to pay that mobile or which the market carrying time. So my initial problem is that uh, it's going to promote informality going to promote more cash economy compared to the cashless the digital agenda. And personally I do believe that the public will use for that to the house and they just looking to the one to stop. Okay. So, so we will have to correct uh, some deal with some challenges with the uh, sound. Yes, 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 yes. But uh, while we do that let's begin the discussions on the uh, benchmark values. Uh, we have the Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, and uh, they are saying that the most by government to scrap the 50% discount on benchmark values, uh, cause, risk causing prices on the market to rise by at least 200%. This follows <laughs> the restoration of the benchmark values of imports by suspending the 50% discount on selected general goods and the 30% discount on vehicles as captured in the 2022 budget. The government mentioned the removal of the 50% bench benchmark values in the 2022 budget. However, I did not state when it will take effect. Uh, okay, so over the last weekend, the, the list um, surfaced from the Ghana Revenue Authority, even though they are telling us they have, don't have the policy approval yet. So this is what Guta has been saying. That's the Union of Traders Association in relation to the reversal of the benchmark values. Even though the government mentioned the removal of the 50% benchmark values in the 2022 budget, it however did not state when it would take effect. 
The policy had earlier been introduced by the government to discourage smuggling and increase revenues, but local producers raised concerns that it made them uncompetitive. Guta, prior to the presentation of the budget, had expressed strong opposition to the removal of the concession, arguing that it would further worsen the plight of the trading community from the impact of the pandemic. President of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obing, says the move by the government will cause a general hike in the price of goods on the market. We are hoping that government being sensitive to the plight because they themselves were the one who tried to prefer a solution for rest. And we thank them for that. So we know that we will sit down and then make sure that we talk through this problem, that they do not reverse us to any problem that we have been um, fighting or the businesses have to contend with. But if it should come, all that it is, is that prices are going to almost double because duty uh, duty is going to be doubled because remember the, the thing is 50% benchmark reduction. So if it is removed, it's 100%. Dr. Obing emphasized that the cost of doing business had gone up and adding the removal of the discount would overwhelm the trading community. The benchmark value has been the mitigating factor that has helped the Ghanaian consuming public by the effects, the harsh effects of the COVID pandemic, the world astro um, 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 astronomical price um, increases where commodity prices have gone up astronomically the free charges have gone up as well in all they've gone up extremely high in the case of free charges gone from about 3,000 to almost 15,000 where commodity prices have gone up between 50% to about 200% the businesses that we used to do have come down. Our turnover have gone down because of these effects. Our consuming public cannot patronize our goods for us to also to turn over. And when we have the little to trade with, we cannot buy the same quantities of goods that we used to buy because prices have gone up uh, uh, elsewhere. So that's uh, Michael Wood's report, but um, ending that report is Dr. Joseph Obing of the Ghana Union of Traders Association. We have Dr. Mpabin back on. The, qu the straight question to you will be about this benchmark value. Two years, I think 2019 when it was being introduced, it was to get much more revenue, but now it looks like there, there's some challenge, and so it's, it's been reversed. At least the proposal mm -hmm. is there. What do you make of um, the decision to reverse it? Um... <laughs> Uh, I think uh, taxes are introduced for purpose. Each particular tax has a purpose uh, for what is introduced. And it's good at point in time again, we review those uh, taxes to see if they achieve the intended purpose. Something which I believe Ghana, we are not so good at doing. Uh, hence, you have uh, the exemptions skyrocketing because you don't review to see which exemptions have to be in place. Um, it's a good idea to review the taxes. But having said that, we have to do so cautiously without distorting the workings of the, uh, of the economic system. Uh, this benchmark value reduction was introduced because there was the assumption that Togo was doing far better. And by reversing or reducing the figures at the port, landlord countries who are our neighbors will be important to us. So the trade volume is likely to go up, which will subsequently lead to an increase in uh, import uh, taxes. Um, but I think records are showing that the, the intended purpose is not really being achieved and it's the, the, the huge expectation of revenue jump is not being realized. Uh, whether we are realizing it or not, we also need to look at, if Ghana is going through our industrialization agenda, then will it be right for us to protect importers at the detriment of our local businesses we need to look at this but crucially we also need to look at does the local businesses have the capacity to meet local demands because if the capacity is only 50 percent then it doesn't make sense to completely remove uh, 
uh, the subsidy, knowing that that complements uh, what you call it, what the local producers are. So to me, yes, it's good to review so we know which items Ghana is capable to produce, which items maybe we are producing 80% capacity, and which items that we are not doing well at all. In that case, instead of giving it maybe on a wholesale 50%, government might be more specific on certain items. So those that we are probably operating around 80% capacity, government can look at it, okay, for those items, I'm only going to allow 20, 30% out of it. But those that we are maybe not doing well, it makes sense to maintain the, four, uh, the 50%. Um, uh, I am for protectionism. That is... It's important if our local producers are doing well, we protect them. But we shouldn't do that if the capacity is not there. Because if that goes on without having the local capacity, chances are that we're actually going to price controls, in which case a uh, few producers in the system might be able to hijack the whole uh, sector or particular type of goods, which may lead to price hikes. So it's... Uh, it's good government reviews it, and definitely I support it, that you don't give it on a wholesale. It's good that periodically we are assessing to see if we are, we are achieving the intended purpose. Uh, but we should do so very cautiously, one, without creating unnecessary distortions uh, at our borders. Because Guta, through their work, uh, contribute a lot in terms of uh, both the taxes they pay at the port and also employment. Uh, any attempt, if it's not properly thought through, could have any uh, negative implications. So I support protecting local industries, but equally we need to have a uh, very context-specific analysis of each particular item to see if local demands are able, uh, are, able uh, are easily met by, by our local producers. All right. So essentially a, a nuanced approach to, towards this um import tax regime and the benchmark values. Uh, let me uh, come to you now, uh, Professor, yeah. on, so, this, on, this, on this issue. So I have a different opinion, and my, 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 mine would, would be quite similar to what the uh, gentleman just said, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Pabin, right? Yeah. Okay. So you see, the reason why we, we, we protect domestic industries mm -hmm. is because the, the whole act of producing um, especially when you start, it's, it's difficult. So, um, and the goods that we normally produce are the ones that we do not have comparative advantage. And some other countries are doing better at that. So if you allow it to come in, you are not going to find your feet. So the idea is to protect. Protection is good. Only if it is done for a period of time. It is not taken for granted. Right. So I'm in for protectionism. And I think that as we begin to reinvent our industrialization from the 1D, 1F, and all of that, we need to give our domestic producers some protection from imports, which is good. And so, whilst we are talking about the 1D, 1F, those of us who heard about the reduction of benchmark values were like, oh, really? In the midst of industrialization, is that what you want to do? Uh, we are made to understand that the goods that we're going to enjoy the discounts were necessary for our own industrialization drive and also to make it um, possible for Ghana to become a destination, at least for the landlord countries, to route their, their goods to Ghana because Togo was taking a lot of the business away. So, I mean, all of these arguments came up. Now, the reason why I have a problem with this is that at times, I have this sense that we don't do any analysis. Okay. <laughs> and we come up with some of these policies. When I look at the list of items I enjoyed the 50% discount, water was one of them. Okay. And I was surprised because I think that our domestic producers can produce the demand that we need. And so in the first place, it shouldn't have got him that discount. Yes. It was totally... It was based on pure economic consideration. Precisely. If it was based on pure economic consideration, there was no reason why we had to allow that to come in with a discount. Because we had a domestic case. Now, what do we do now? I also do not believe that we should take away all the discounts. Okay. Why? Because, you see, we need to do market analysis. 
our suppliers have their response, their, cap their, their, their capability. I'm going to take this simple case. Okay. Let us say Ghana has a demand of 2 million tons of rice every year. Our domestic producers can produce 0 0.5 million tons. Right. If you say that because of them, you are going to take away the discounts, what is going to happen? The 1.5 million that will be imported in will come at a much higher cost. And it's the ultimate consumer who is going to pay. And the consumers also need to have goods at a price that is lower for them. Because if it comes at a higher price, they, they can buy less. And their consumer welfare is taken away from them. So we need to estimate the response capacity of our domestic producers. In every product that we have the capacity to produce, there is no reason why there should be a discount on the benchmark one. And whether Guta likes it or not, we need industrialization to generate the employment that we need in this economy to move our economy forward, especially agro-processing. Because that is the endowment that we have. We need to begin to add value to our culture product so that we can expand our economy, create jobs. And so it will even become possible for them, rather than being importers, now to become exporters. Because when our domestic firms are doing it well, and true after, we can export to other countries in Africa, then they don't need to import. They can turn themselves into exporters, buy from the domestic producers, and then export the goods to other countries. So they should also come to a realization that we cannot kill our industrialization because we need to import. Mm -hmm. At the same time, on their side, and I'm on their side because I have a suspicion that some of the products that we've moved the benchmark values, we will not have the capacity to, to produce for the entire demand that we have. Sugar is an example. So Sklenka is an example. We need as much as possible to estimate the supply response. Look at the demand. Look at the, the shortfall in supply. And then think of the benchmark value to bring in that supply at the minimum cost to the average consumer. That is rural analysis. That is what we need to do. Every trade policy that will put domestic producers at a disadvantage is a wrong trade policy. Because our trade policy is supposed to further our development objectives. So I will not say that the, the benchmark values reduction was a good thing. I thought that there were more arguments that were advanced for the reason why. But mm -hmm. when I looked at the products, when it was, I, I checked yeah, it from your yeah. website, yeah. I was very surprised about some of them. So as a way forward. This time, pharmaceutical companies are complaining as well. Precisely. And medicaments and pharmaceutical products are one of the things that we have compared with advantage. I have a PhD student who did an assessment of the goods that Ghana has advantage in. And this, these two were at the, on the top of the list. So this is something that we even need to give more support to the domestic producers for them to produce and even export to other African countries. Because we have the advantage in that. And so there's no reason why we should allow imports to come and compete with them. But also, like I mentioned, clinker and sugar, we do not have the capacity. The benchmark value should go back on them. Otherwise, the average Ghanaian is going to have to pay a higher price for the product. That has nothing to do but just because of the inefficiency of our producers mm -hmm. who are inefficient and they cannot meet the market uh, uh, competition. And therefore, um, we need to take a look at that. We also need to look at the case of the East Asians. Okay. They did it so well. They did import substitution industrialization and then they moved on to export promotion. I mean, this is something I just thought uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> on our a few months ago. <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, he, would, he would use it. I mean, <laughs> that is, that is, <laughs> was it in the exam? It was in the exam. And the point is this they made sure that in giving their domestic firm protection, they gave them timelines. They had to make sure that over the time that they joined the protection, they were going to use the extra that they gained from the protection to invest in their productive capacity to reduce their cost and become innovative because there was a timeline to the protection because as soon as the timeline elapsed, the protection was going to take off. And the Asians did it so well that by the time it, it was taken off, they were able to compete. And that is how East Asian countries like Taiwan, Singapore, 
uh, South Korea and Co. are now leaders in trade. That is what we need to do. We got it wrong during independence when Nkrumah set up state-owned enterprises to do that. And the state-owned enterprises thought that, okay, once you are state-owned, the protection was going to be there forever. Now that we are doing a Paris satellite industrialization with the 1D1F, where the state is taking a backstage, we need to revisit that theory. It's, it's applicable. It's something that we can do. It's something that will help our firms. And the government should give a clear signal to the AGI yeah. that they shouldn't think that this process cannot be reversed. Okay. They should begin to put in place interventions to reduce their costs and become competitive. Because if Ghana doesn't improve its competitiveness, then this whole talk about after is just, <laughs> just a talk. We should forget about it. Because if you can take advantage of the African market, then what, what are we talking about? And, and we are even fortunate that we are in a sub-region in West Africa where when you talk about the size of our economy, you are number two to Nigeria. And the market in West Africa alone is good market for us. If we don't take advantage of it, then there's nothing else that we need to talk about, even our agenda of looking beyond aid. So we need to do well-informed analysis to guide some of these policies. And so you find out that at the end of the day, Guta gets something, AGI gets something, and then we're able to have this uh, what you optimized uh, uh, policy that will get all of us to the level that we want to get to. But I don't believe in either the discount or the discount is not there. We need to take a look at specific product, estimate all that we need to estimate about supply response, the demand, how, what is going to happen to the price when we take away the discount and all of that. But I don't believe what the... Uh, the Guta is saying that it's going to lead to over 200 percent percent increase. But I don't, I don't believe in that. I mean, so uh, that is just let policymakers know that be careful about your inflation targets. And if you don't take care, we are going to lead. I mean, so that is that is all part of advocacy and all of that. But I think that it's it's good that some of the uh, the discounts have been moved off. AGI was was complaining, and and um, like I said, in two years ago when it came out, we were like, really, industrialization? You want to do this? I mean, so it's good that at times we try, we find that, hey, the good thing about this government is they listen, unlike the other previous government. They listen. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, they listen a lot. They go and they come back. But it's, be ha it's be happening too frequently. And I think that next time, when we begin to think about some of these things, let us subject it to well-informed analysis. The data is there. We could have done this before we started all of this. And we didn't have got into this point. Mm -hmm. So that is my view on the on the benchmark values. I'll come to you on this issue. Right. Whether um, it's, it's, yeah. it's a policy a lot, a lot, a lot, or a it's be as a result of government lessons. Yeah. Uh, a lot's been said about this. And um, over the last, uh, I think, two weeks, there's been healthy debate between AGI and Kuta. Uh, policy, policy itself should not be cast into stone. Yeah. I mean, there, there's an element in policy where you take... Um, feedback and then you put back into the process to ensure that it's 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 meeting the the, the objects of the of the policy. When we set out to do this in 2019, some of the objects were to increase upon traffic at the ports and uh, were extended to improving upon government revenues. The other bit was also to prices for the welfare of citizenry. I mean, if you are going to get this thing in cheaper, then they were going to be able to afford it, and it was going to have an impact on their welfare. If after two years, given where we find ourselves today, the importance of us uh, pursuing industrialization policy, the importance of us looking at items where we have capacity to produce, it's, it's very obvious. I mean, like, like Prof mentioned, an item like water, I hear tissue paper as well. I have not seen the, the, the actual tissue paper and, and things that um, we, could, we could actually... Even if we don't have capacity, it wouldn't take a lot for us to build local capacity in, 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 over time to be able to produce them. This is where the world is going. And examples are bound round, round, <laughs> everywhere where people pursue policies like this and it's inured to the benefit of their economies. So why can we do same? I can understand the position of Guta. Equally, I am also on the side of AGI. We have to find a, a, a good balance. That will improve upon the welfare of the city. I, I think that's ultimate. When we did put that policy in place in 2019, there were expectations that prices would come down. I don't think that we were able to get to that. 
I don't think we, uh, we were able to achieve that policy of getting prices to, to, to be reduced on our, in our markets. And the target of revenues as well. The target of revenues. You see, the dynamics changed. The, the placement of, let's say, Temahabo within the first five um, um, ports in Africa, the positions kept changing. But I, I think that there were other counter policies in other ports that actually outshined the, the objects that we wanted to achieve in Ghana. And so traffic were still in some other ports within the sub-region that we had expected that with the implementation of the benchmark policy, we'd have directed that traffic to them. And that, that, that did not happen. And so over time, if we are not achieving that object, it is good and proper mm -hmm. that we assess the policy again and go back to a drawing, drawing point. That is, that is what it is. That's how policy is, is there. We can't say that because we did that this in 2019, although when we are still not achieving the, 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 the objects of it, we will we'll still pursue it. And it's also very important that we can do 1D1F and still be importing things like this that we can actually, even if we don't have capacity now, potentially we can, we can, we can build that capacity. How do, you, how do you import water into a system and expect that you create job, job opportunities for, for the teeming young people in the country? We cannot continue to do this. It is, it is good that um, we, we, are, we have announced that this, this policy is going to be reversed, but that, that is not the end of it. I, I am privy that there's still engagement of, of especially AGI and Guta, okay. and I am sure that the government is going to come out with a policy that ultimately improves the welfare of the citizenry. For me, that's the ultimate. It is not about Guta or AGI. It is about the citizens of Ghana. Are they getting the best from our trade policies? That's it. So it's good that the engagement is still happening. <coughs> We're still going on the engagement. But for now, let us go back to that policy. Let's look at it again and make the best out of, out of our future. Let me make an intervention here. I think that part of the reason why we fail to attract the volume of trade. I mean, West Africa, Ghana is so fortunate. We have the highest number of landlord countries in the whole world. And why Ghana cannot take advantage of this, I, I do not understand. But the major issue has been our road network. Okay. I mean, to, to, to re-export from Tema to Burkina Faso, look at the challenge. Example. Look at the challenge. Look at the traffic at Trimota all the way. The, the stock of railway, if that materializes, precisely. probably that would. So, so, precisely. 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 So we need, we need to work on these infrastructure, trade facilitation. Okay. Key. If we do that, I'm sure that we will attract all the trade to West, uh, uh, to West Africa through Ghana. And the job opportunity that that will come up with, I mean, enormous. We should only be looking at industrialization. Trade is also key. Trade is very key to achieve your developmental goals. Countries that were like us in 1960, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, where are they now? They use trade. And we can do the same. The case study is there. So we can take and try as much as possible if we cannot even get to the levels that they've got into, move ahead of our peers in Africa. And we, it's something that we can do. So the infrastructure is key. The trade infrastructure is key. Otherwise, no matter the opportunities of hosting the after here, if we don't benefit from it, all we get to do is to host conferences and all of that. But that shouldn't be the objective of us hosting the after. The objective was to be the leader in Africa to drive that process. And the infrastructure is key. The road line that I hear that the roads are being stolen now, when it's even not complete, it's, it's something that is, is, is it's hurting. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be happening. And it's just one road line. Well, I was expecting six or eight rail lines. Yeah. Because you see, goods have to, and if we do that, the cost of transporting goods from Tema to all those landlord countries will be cheaper. And the importers there will use Tema as a port. Yeah. And look at the amount of revenue you are going to raise out of that. So we need to take a look at that. And, I had to do that intervention because of what he, he said about the fact that uh, position keeps on changing. It's because of the infrastructure. We don't have the infrastructure. And if once we get infrastructure up and doing, I think that we should be able to get the business. Okay. For that intervention, what's coming to you? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the major issue here is that, once again, government is not talking to the stakeholders. Government is not sharing the expectation with the stakeholders. You mentioned things like when they reduce the benchmark, the expected prices to go. I don't know whether they had sat down with some of the stakeholders, the major stakeholders like Klinka, um, the, the sugar and rice and all of those things. Is that exactly where the expectation is, prices are going to go down. 
But one of the main reasons why prices are not going down is not just because of the benchmark. The benchmark is where it is. It's the cost of doing business in the country. And that is the major issue that we are not attacking. And I had a conversation with a, a trader and a businessman recently, and he said the biggest issue for him is the cost of money, one, and two, the depreciation of the city. Those are the two main issues. And I think government needs to focus on that. More importantly, you should have a game plan as a, as a government. You should have a game plan with all the data you have. If you know you are importing 1.5 million um, tons of, of rice versus production of 500, why can't you produce 2, two million? And then you look at the bigger picture. In the landlocked countries, do they import? How much do they import? Why can't you supply them? So you then tailor a policy in the country, sitting down with major investors, big players, as to how this is going to be done. Whether you're going to help the outgrowers, whether you're going to have an outgrower facility. Thinking has to come into managing this economy. And that's why I go back to your EMT again, the economic management team. We have a lot of economists, prof here, is sharing a lot of information. Most of them have gone to the same schools. Most of them have learned the same things that he has learned, economics 101, economics 202, 303, 404. But they are not applying it. And the question, no, let me land, let me land. The question, yeah, the, the question is, you have to have a plan. It looks as if we don't have a plan. You have the data. First, we said we didn't have the data. Now you have the data. You, you are consulting with the players to understand exactly what is going on in the country. Why can't we produce 2 million uh, uh, tons of rice okay. instead of 500? When is it going to take us, if we put this and this and this in place, talk to the big players, agree with them, if government puts this and this in place, how are we going to get to 2 million? Mm -hmm. After that, private sector is going to take over and say, we can now increase it to 3 million, 4 million, because there is a market. Mm -hmm. There is a market in Ghana right now, but something is stifling us from meeting that demand. Mm -hmm. And as such, we are importing. It's easy to import. Importers have big lobbies. They are lobbying and uh, reducing things. We are hearing other things that we're not paying the right taxes at, at port. There are a lot of lobby going on. There's a lot of interventions from government officials and a lot of interventions from customs officials reducing things for people to bring in, uh, under invoicing. All of that is going on right under our noses. What is the EMT doing? How are they ensuring? that they are pushing government, they are pushing the, um, the policy makers, they are pushing the execution guys to make sure that we, we, we stick to the plan. Then we go back and measure with the same stakeholders as to, we agreed if we do this, this will happen. Is it happening? If it is not happening, why is it not happening? So you go back and you tweak your, your strategy. Like I say, you don't change strategy just because something is not working. Is it the players that are not working? Is it, is it, is it, is it the policy? Does it need to be tweaked? You, you have to run this economy like a business. You really have to involve all stakeholders, ensure that they understand what the end game is, and they bring their input as to how we are going to measure as getting there. We are not doing that as a country. We are not doing that as a government. We are not doing that working with the various stakeholders and consulting with them. I'm sure it came as a surprise to Guta that this thing was removed. And they, and they don't understand why. Because maybe the KPIs, the key performing indicators that were set, are not being met. But does Guta know that they are not being met? Maybe not. Why not? Because we are not talking. As a country, we need to start talking to each other. Okay. We'll take a break here. When I come back, we will wrap up the discussion on the benchmark values and, and today's program. We'll back after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. This is still the big issue. We're discussing the reversal of the 50%, 30% benchmark values on imports. Uh, that is policy that took effect some two years ago. It looks like there's some tinkering going on with it as we speak. Uh, would we get into the final uh, minute moment of um, our discussion here on, on the big issue. But let, for now, let, I want to engage the uh, fiscal policy expert on what alternatives exist. I mean, looking at the you and cry associated with the reversal. So, Dr. Uh, Ampabi, what, are, what yes. are the alternatives in this in, in this case? I think to, to me, the alternative is that 
uh, government needs to start looking for more creative ways and more sustainable way of raising revenue. And I was very happy to hear of um, uh, the common platform to be implemented by the district assemblies, uh, the MMDAs from general mm -hmm. on property taxation. Uh, across the world, especially uh, in Europe, for example, property tax makes about uh, uh, almost 2.5% of their GDP. Africa is averaging 0.38%. And Ghana, um, we are only taxing or we have only captured 9% of properties. So it's going to the point where we need to have one standardized valuation system, a way that landlords are able to see by logging into the account how much they have to pay, what their tax liabilities are. Um, local authorities are also able to identify which house, who owns it, and there's a complete database of every house around. Um, also, the tax exemptions. I'm happy to hear that the bill is going to be passed by end of year. Uh, according to the IMF on their fourth consultation document, um, I think on, on page 71 of the document, it actually says, we are losing 21 billion in exemptions. Last year, we were here talking about we are losing 4.6 billion, but this is a recent study to 2021, saying that Ghana is losing 5% of its uh, GDP in the form of tax freebies. Again, I'm not saying exemptions are bad, but it's going to time when we need to strategize the kind of exemptions we are giving away. We need to have a more coordinated, managed exemption. So at the end of the year, we're able to tell what we give away, what do we get in return? What exemptions do we need to continue? Which ones do we need to modify? And which ones do we have to abolish? Uh, same taxes is also one area government can also equally look at. I think it, uh, it presents a very good uh, opportunity. And crucially, leakages is one area government has, as a matter of agency, uh, have to prioritize. And to, to finalize it all, um, e-taxation, and I think I'll go for this e-taxation versus uh, the other taxation you spoke about earlier. Obviously, no country develops without effective tax system. Mm. So the point I'm making is I'm nowhere near saying that people shouldn't pay taxes. As you know, we've been doing this tax dialogue with city for the last two years. And what we're doing is to encourage Ghanaians to pay taxes. We want government to have the tax revenue to be able to provide what we want and reduce our dependency on external financing. But we need to be creative and be more uh, uh, up there in terms of looking for more sustainable approach. Currently, you can sit online and buy almost everything you want in Ghana. And I'm not talking for, uh, uh, for those who are just earning 100 or 200 a day. But you can actually buy a house worth $1 million by logging into your computer right here in Ghana. As a stance, do we have a way of taxing these people? So it might be right for government to now say, okay, all the online selling platforms, before you can register somebody to sell, we need their Ghana card or their passport. So then we know who is actually selling on what platforms. Again, we're able to determine uh, fraudulent activities because if all sellers are verified, it's pretty much easier to one counter fraud, fraudulent activities was being able to assess who is making what sales and then being able to talk to the uh, platform owners. Uh, uh, being able to talk to the platform owner. I don't know if you can hear me, I think I can hear some echo. Hello? Yes. Okay. So, yes. So, in that case, one, we are able to tell who is selling on what platform because if you allow those online platform owners to register people before they allow to open an account and sell online. It's pretty much easier. We, finally, the artisans, uh, we normally you call these guys masons, masons. Somebody can put up cities, FM's building, this whole structure in a matter of two, three months. But then set, most of them are operating under the informality. How are we bringing those people into the tax net? You have the, the plumbers, you have the uh, the electricians, I'm not saying those making, barely making ends meet, no. But I'm talking about those who are making substantial revenue, whom we need to find a way of targeting. So you're going to step outside the box, be more creative, look for more sustainable way of generating revenue than uh, some of those regressive measures. So if you ask for my alternative to the government, 
these are what I have in mind for now. Well, well, Franklin, your concluding remarks on this on the issue, especially with benchmarks, since you've not had a, you've not had a bite of the issues, yes, in about a minute or two. Hello. Okay. All right. So we, I'll, I'll then bring it into the studio. Beginning with Prof. Final thoughts on the discussions we've had on the budget. Okay. So uh, my final thoughts <laughs> will be Franklin. Did you, did you, were you asking me to say something? Yes, yes. My question was about your uh, f final, final thoughts, concluding uh, thoughts on the discussions we've had here. We may zero in on the benchmark since you've not had a bite of the issue. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong trying to review uh, a policy, by the way. And I think I understand uh, when Prof talks about the, the need to review the items and then review the rate as well. Um, my only problem is that I don't think they've done, that we've not seen any particular paper that suggests that, well, because of this, revenues have dipped. Um, I have a feeling that this is also this is a revenue mobilization drive rather than just the issue of supporting local uh, production. Um, but then I also think that the conversation about being able to protect the local industry so that they'll be able to export to other countries suppose or uh, presumes that those other countries will not one day wake up and say, well, listen, we also want to protect our local market anyway. I think the conversation should be more tailored towards the cost of doing business. And I, frankly, I don't care where I get my goods from. As long as I'm able to buy cheaply and able to save and it's of quality as well. So the market should be allowed to reign. Other countries that protected their markets, if we talk about the likes of Brazil, India, and uh, China, at some point, they are now asking to be protected against others who are also beginning to <laughs> grow. So it becomes cyclical. I think we need to balance it properly. And that's all I've got to say. Okay. Well, final to say that okay the the budget is a good budget definitely um for me it is refreshing that we are putting in place measures to show up our revenue um 20 percent of gdp um i think that we also need to rationalize our expenditure um without any um listening to any 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 institution i think that <clears throat> the discussion of i've had a discussion about the the Chamber of Parliament and attempts to add 30 seats to Parliament. I think that um, Ghana has to come to a discussion to find out if our parliamentary system is not having an overbearing impact on our expenditures as well. I, I think that Ghana, with our size of our economy and our population, shouldn't have more than 150 members of Parliament, given that we have a local government system, right from the Assembly member to the Assembly, that is also in, in charge of the grassroots sort of governance. I don't think that if you take a whole economy like the U.S., the Senate members, the number that they have, if you go into some of the states that have a bigger size economy than Ghana economy, they don't have those uh, uh, number of legislators. We, we also take, need to take a second look at that. I think that rather than build a bigger chamber, we need to reduce the number of members of parliament okay. because that also is a huge outlay out of our budget, especially every four years, when you have to look for money to pay as Russia to members of parliament. I think that thing has to stop. Mm -hmm. You see, Ghana, we need, to, we need to get to the point where we come to a realization that we're also part of the problems that we are going through. Mm -hmm. our, revenues, our, our revenues are not in touch with our expenditure. What are we doing to rationalize our expenditure? Mm -hmm. Why should members of parliament enjoy ex, ex Russia? What for? It's a service to your nation. You decided to go in there. Mm. Once you are done and you lose your seat, go and lead your life. Mm. I mean, I've been teaching the university for 22 years. Mm. I've never got any years grad here. But I'm sure if I was a member of parliament mm. for that 22 years, <laughs> I'd have been giving us grad more than five times. You see, these are the sort of things that we need to discuss. I mean, I'm very honest with you. It's part of the way in which you can rationalize our expenditure, not to make it overbearing, and every time increasing the members of parliament. I mean, it's, okay, it's, so it's, it's not right. So, so it has to, those are the top need to, need to take a bit of So it. we need to take a look at that. And those, those are my final comments on the budget. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, 
I disagree. I, I don't think this budget mm -hmm. is addressing the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. I don't think that um, there has been a lot of consultation with a lot of people like Guta, like uh, the telcos, um, having a, an a e levy. Um, it's a knee jerk reaction budget, uh, trying to meet expenditure with revenue that they haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. Um, they need to address the major problems in the country, which is the cost of doing business. The cost of doing business has not been addressed. The city has depreciated. It's now close to 6.3. Although Bank of Ghana still shows uh, 5.9 something. I don't know how they get that. Interbank means that you are finding out what the banks are trading between themselves, and, and it's about 6.3. So this, the depreciation of the city is high. Uh, interest rates are still high. Uh, they're over 20%. Um, the various taxes that um, the individuals are, play, are paying. This government has had more revenue than any government uh, and they have not applied it uh, judiciously. Um, we have challenges with um, our use of our oil revenue. We have challenges um, from the Auditor General on um, various infractions um, uh, which is increasing uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, if, the, if the government wants sectors to grow, then government needs to have policies that are driven for those sectors to grow, and, it's, and I'm not seeing that happening. We also need to ensure that we address the real arrears of this country, the real debt of this country. It's far higher than it's, it's being shown because a lot of it is being hidden in the state-owned um, enterprises and also it's been hidden. Uh, by not paying uh, contractors. We have over 30 billion unpaid arrears. Uh, we need to address all of that. So right. the government needs to put in policies to address these things. Okay. So. Yeah, Duke, I, I, I think a lot of the issues that um, has been, has been, um, has been, has been discussed, I mean, the government itself is, it's, it's acknowledges a lot of the um, leakages. Government is trying to use digitalization to be able to pluck some of the leakages in the system, such that because I don't have to pay cash, um, money actually gets to where it has to go. Uh, business environment today, our policy rate is hovering around 13 percent. You could appreciate how it's how 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 we have worked on this policy rate over over the last couple of years. And um, the exchange rate, yes, we probably will get to a point where we. We'll, we want to have the, the very minutest of depreciation. But to, today, the currency, I think today, they suffered 0.8%. We are still working at it. We are not there yet, but it's, it's, it's a process. What we are saying is that this budget actually gives people the, 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 the hope, the prosperity that we are talking about. It gives the young people of this nation opportunities. That's what we want to create for them. So they become productive, add up to the GDP, and then the welfare of Ghanaians in total will improve. So that is what this budget actually sets out. And all we call for is support of Ghanaians of all facets of our, of our national life to be able okay. to support the government policy for us to achieve what we, we, we set out to do. Thank so that's you. how we wrap up today's edition of The Big Issue. My name is Duke Pento. We're starting for a regular host, Godfrey Dakotoba. We had in the studio Mr. Alex Mode, former GMPC CEO, uh, Dr. Professor um, Ebo Texan of the Associate Professor of the Department of Economics, University of Ghana, uh, former MP for Kankwe North, member of the Finance Committee, self -Sain. And of course, we had on Zoom Dr. Alex Ampabin and Franklin Kudu. Keep watching CCTV for the very best in programming.